Hi all, welcome back to 5WH, my name's Joe, as always, and I like talking about world events that are off the beaten track. Covid, Trump and Brexit will only appear where strictly necessary, and I hope you'll enjoy hearing about some things that most news organisations skip over. I'm offering this, as always, in the 5WH format, which means we'll be addressing the questions of what, who, when, where, why and how, in whatever order the, uh, the facts dictate. And the idea is this, that will allow you to get the bottom line up front and provide you with some context should you choose to dig further. They should also act as a firm handrail to stop me vanishing down too many tangential rabbit holes. If you like what you hear or want to leave a comment, please join me along with your fellow listeners at 5WH on Facebook. And today's episode is titled, unimaginatively, Caucasian Chaos. Uh, Leading off from that, we'll be having a look at the recent flare in the frozen conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan that's kicked off in the last week. On a quick note, before we jump in with our what, I feel obliged to say that because this situation is changing at quite some pace, um, the intelligence cutoff for what we'll be discussing is approximately 1300 hours UK time uh, on the 30th of September, so everything is subject to change. So, jumping right in then, what's been going on here? Heavy fighting has broken out between Azerbaijan and Armenia over the contested region of Nagorno-Karabakh. Reporting currently suggests that several dozen soldiers have been killed on both sides, with civilian and military casualties rumoured to reach the hundreds. The fighting has rapidly exceeded the occasional tit-for-tat exchanges of mortar and artillery fire that frequently occur in this region, and combat units for both sides are now manoeuvring in a cycle of attack and counterattack along the front line. Video footage, alleged to be from the conflict, has shown a number of tanks being destroyed, and media reporting has suggested that multiple helicopters and at least one fighter aircraft has been shot down. As an aside, if you want to see some of the seriously heavy firepower uh, being brought to bear in this conflict, just Google the TOS-1A heavy flamethrower. This is currently in use by Azerbaijan and is the most command and conquerish thing I have ever seen. The reason we're particularly fretting about this uh, is that there are concerns that other regional powers, specifically Russia and Turkey, are supporting opposing sides in this conflict, and that therefore it may develop into a more protracted proxy conflict. These fears are not allayed by both sides' promises to escalate. Both Armenia and Azerbaijan have announced martial law, and Armenia has barred all males over 18 from leaving the country, assumedly to ensure its access to manpower should conscription or other extreme measures be required. So we'll now jump into the where and try and give some geographical context to this conflict. Armenia and Azerbaijan are located in the southern Caucasus between the Black and Caspian Seas. They directly border each other, as you could probably have guessed by the fact they're currently engaged in a land war with each other, Uh, However, I think we need to understand a bit of the wider context, specifically with the nations surrounding them. So we'll start uh, at the north and move clockwise. So Azerbaijan borders Georgia, Russia, the Caspian Sea, in which it has an extensive coastline, and Iran to the south. Armenia, as the western most of the territories, also borders Iran to the south, has a shared border with Turkey, and then Georgia again to the north can see here that these two territories occupy a geopolitical hotspot between multiple competing powers and why that geography makes it likely that other competing regional factions may want to pick sides. Dialing in a little deeper, the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh region is a semi-autonomous Armenian majority region of Azerbaijan. It's located close to, but not directly on, the recognised national borders. Uh, However, the recognised borders are not the de facto ones on the ground, and Armenian informal control has existed for the last few decades, sort of, in the surrounding area. Um, We should also bear in mind, of course, that they are currently at war with each other, which means that the very concept of borders is fluid, at best, right now. Uh, The terrain of the region is highly mountainous, which has likely contributed a significant element to its independence, making it a very hard place to... uh, take control of, and it's the kind of place that makes serious offensive military operations a logistical nightmare. We need to jump into the who now. Typically, I would introduce the parties here, however, I think we've already addressed what their names are. So we're going to use this section to 
just flesh out exactly what they've got in terms of assets for this war and also look at some of the foreign parties backing them up and try and tease out the differences in how this will go. So we're going to jump in starting with Armenia, the defensive party in this uh, scuffle. As far as it goes internationally, they're primarily Russian supported uh, with close military relations on that basis uh, with some evidence of integration and joint training exercises occurring, you know, not infrequently. It's also worth noting they are not recognized as a nation by Turkey, you know, which they border politically, how, uh, as you'd expect, very close to Russia. They're a member of Russia's rival Eurasian blocs, aiming to counterbalance the EU. However, the country's political system does not seem to be particularly anti-EU. It's most likely that this stance is determined by NATO member and EU wannabe Turkey refusing to accept its statehood, kind of forcing its hand in that regard. In terms of troops and assets, they've got roughly 42,000 regular soldiers, uh, including a separate but integrated Nagorno-Karabakh defence army and an air force of roughly 3,000 men. Both of these forces are made of uh, a combination of volunteer troops supported by selective conscription on 24-month terms. Now, with any comparison of force, uh, numbers are only a, a very crude comparator, We've also got to have a, look, a little bit into equipment, and I think the key point to take away here is that, uh, from what I understand from open source stuff, most of Armenia's military equipment is, at best, sort of late 90s, early 2000s Russian, a lot of it's Soviet inheritance, and there's no other significant providers of that equipment. On the other hand, we've got Azerbaijan. Uh, in terms of foreign policy, uh, a special relationship with Turkey is a key part of their political platform. Despite this, however, they still use extensive amounts of Russian equipment, uh, primarily due to their Soviet legacy, although the relationship here appears to be much more mercantile. In, it's just simply a case of, we have some stuff that works, we'll buy some new stuff that's compatible. The, part, the country has actively engaged with NATO's partnership for peace programs, which is significantly short of membership, but does indicate its sort of general leaning in the world. In terms of troops, we're talking about a 56,000 strong regular army, this time still with um, selective conscription backing up volunteer troops, slightly shorter conscription term of only 18 months. The, the key difference I think we need to tease out here is that their air force is 8,500 men, which is very nearly three times the size of Armenia's. Apart from this slight numerical difference here, we're looking at a lot of Soviet or Russian heavy equipment, but with some evidence that they've had more recent procurement programs, meaning their equipment they can field is of likely better quality than that fielded by the Armenians. And again, really worth emphasizing the difference in the Air Force and the capabilities there. Further, they've also looked into getting some kit from outside the former Soviet sphere, with Israel being a particularly notable supplier. I haven't managed to find any specific details on that, again, open source, but generally Israel tends to provide quite a lot of high-tech stuff to countries in the region. They specialise in drones and communications equipment, so that, again, that's only conjecture on my part, but that's likely what they're looking at. They also appear to have acquired, they've either acquired drones from Turkey or are receiving support from drones operated by Turkey. Again, this war is only about four days old, so we'll have to uh, see where that leads. So now we need to roll on to the when. The war between Azerbaijan and Armenia that led to the existence of this contested territory occurred in the early 90s, culminating with a ceasefire in 1994. Since that time, we've had, you know, intermittent exchanges of artillery. Last time I was working in an open source centre, you know, you could almost set your clock by the um, daily reports of artillery or mortar, mortar strike between the two parties. However... The massive spike has occurred uh, much more recently. On Sunday 27th of September 2020, Azerbaijani forces seized an area containing roughly seven villages and threatened to massacre the Armenian troops within that area if they failed to surrender. Then, following on, on September 29th, an Armenian Su-25 Frogfoot ground attack aircraft was shot down. Armenia has blamed Turkey for this as the only regional air force to operate F-16s, which was the type of aircraft performing the shootdown. As of the morning of September 30th, Azerbaijan claims to have 
neutralised 2,300 Armenian troops. Clearly, this does not necessarily mean they've been killed. Uh, looking at the death tolls of other recent conflicts, such as that in Ukraine, this does seem somewhat on the high side for a four-day period. Either way, though, the uh, trajectory of the conflict is definitely in an upwards direction. So now we get onto the topic of why. And I think we need to firstly set expectations a little bit now and indicate that as the war is currently all of four days old, you know, this is to any extent conjecture. However, current reporting strongly suggests that Azerbaijan started the conflict. So why would they do that? Well, ultimately, Azerbaijan was the losing party in the war in the early 90s. They had to cede, or functionally cede anyway, a significant part of territory, uh, including the Nagorno-Karabakh region. Despite this, however, Nagorno-Karabakh is still internationally recognised as part of Azerbaijan. So as far as Azerbaijan is concerned, they're entitled to deal with the territory as necessary, and similarly entitled to the people and resources within it. Um, as to, you know, more, um, more present concerns, smaller border clashes that sort of fit within the normal scope of things uh, led to protests in Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, in July, uh, indicating at least some level of groundswell support for air quotes, reunification with the lost territories. So that would appear to be the underlying long slash short term motives as far as Azerbaijan's concerned. Armenia's motives in this conflict are somewhat simpler. The Nagorno-Karabakh region's inhabitants are primarily Armenian, and Armenia had de facto control over that region until, or well, still does now, it's losing bits around the edge at the moment, but generally speaking, their objective, their motivation, is simply to maintain what they already have. In terms of the possibility of them having started the conflict somehow, frankly, I can't see an incentive for them to have done so. Um, their long-term aims would have simply been to normalise the situation as is, and therefore I see nothing for them to gain via armed conflict. You know, in terms of an offensive armed conflict, obviously they they, they stand to gain something from defending their gains which they currently are doing. We've also then got to look a little wider. Um, this again is an evolving situation. I don't want to oversell any political dimension to this. But we've had a look at Turkey and Russia supporting opposing sides in this conflict. It's of interest to note that Turkey and Russia have also found themselves supporting different factions in Syria, Libya and now the Caucasus. The interesting point here, I guess, is that both of both Turkey and Russia, despite one being a NATO member and one obviously being, you know, Russia, um, are essentially revanchist autocracies, by which I mean they are headed by a strong leader, head of a single party or functionally single party state with a sham democracy. Um, the leaders of both are playing the what I'd like to call the restoration of empire card as a key part of bolstering their political support. Um the ultimate irony of this really comes down to the fact that both the Ottoman Empire, now Turkey, and the Russian Empire, unsurprisingly now Russia, were significant and armed, you know, frequently armed rivals when they were empires until their dissolution in World War One. So we do see a, an element, perhaps, of history repeating itself here. Um, although perhaps we should go with the, uh, well, I'm not sure who to attribute the saying to, but it's a uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, and I think I think we see a very clear poem. Uh, developing here. So now we get to jump into the how. Um, we're just going to waffle through a quick timeline of this because I think that'll give you the best understanding of the status quo at present and then we can see how it goes from there. So on 0800 hours on the 27th of September, Azerbaijan launched offensive operations by air and artillery against settlements in Nagorno-Karabakh, including the regional capital Stepanakert. Within the hour, this was followed by infantry and armoured forces advancing with the support of drones and a continued bombardment. By the end of the day, Azerbaijani forces claimed to have seized seven villages, however immediately undermined this statement by demanding the surrender of garrison troops within those villages, which, um, you know, a bit fishy. Um, in addition, one stray artillery shell somehow landed in part of Iran. If you're looking at a map, you'll realise that someone needs to go to remedial gunnery school. On the 28th of September, 
Armenian forces launched some counterattacks, reportedly regaining several lost positions. The Azerbaijani forces released extensive footage claiming to show them destroying a large amount of Armenian hardware and vehicles via airstrikes. However, this one-sided release of media and kill claims makes it hard to understand the true balance in the conflict. It is possible that Azerbaijan has a greater need to demonstrate its successes in the war to justify starting it, and therefore, understandably, has a much slicker media operation in progress. We can also add that another two artillery rockets landed in Iran. Clearly, more lessons are needed. On the 29th of September, it was my birthday, and in celebration, Azerbaijan launched offensive operations against Fusili City, alongside wider action along the wider front line. Armenian forces counterattacked, and this appears to have resulted in a stalemate around Fusili, and not much of a change across the rest of the line either. Azerbaijan also indicated an intent to relocate strategic S-300 anti-aircraft missiles to the Nagorno-Karabakh region. Um, this is a pretty serious piece of hardware. Uh, while it naturally poses a threat to the Armenian uh, air capability, it may also be intended as a disincentive towards other technologically advanced nations from intervening. Uh, it would be a serious deterrent to the imposition of measures such as no-fly zones, as the system would pose a massive threat to the aircraft placing said no-fly zone. Later in the day, an Armenian Stu-25 was shot down by an F-16, allegedly. Turkey is the only operator of this aircraft in the region, and they deny conducting the intercept. Azerbaijan suggests, in turn, that the Su-25 simply crashed. On the morning of 30th September, so the last uh, thing I've been able to look at before recording this, uh, the Iranians shot down an Az Azerbaijani drone, which strayed into Iranian territory, and otherwise... Although conflict continues, there doesn't appear to be a significant change on the ground. I just need to add to this that although it's kind of hard to uh, conceptualise this without a map to hand, it must be emphasised that Azerbaijan appears to be focusing its efforts on the lowland areas on all sides of the region, um, apparently actively avoiding entering the mountains. It's likely, therefore, they have a limited appetite to engage in the mountainous regions, and they perceive that their success in the lowlands and urban areas will be sufficient to achieve their wider objectives. And now, sadly folks, it's time to wrap up. Clearly this conflict is ongoing, and it's entirely likely I'm going to wind up recording something else on this in the near future. So, in the meantime though, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please hit follow, subscribe, download, whatever the options are on your uh, favourite podcast service. And I'd really love it if you joined me on Facebook, uh, along with your fellow followers. Just search 5WH, feel free to leave us a comment. Otherwise, thanks and see you soon guys. Bye.